Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I should have had you keep your hymnals out. Pull them back out if you would. Turn to page 324. So in the middle of our, our hymnal is Luther's small catechism, which is the basic summary of the faith that we teach. And I want to focus, at least at the beginning, our attention on what we call the third petition of the Lord's Prayer, page three, again, page 324. The Lord's Prayer is structured like this. It has an introduction and a conclusion, and in between are seven petitions or requests of God. And the third is this. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So now on the left side of the page there, you should see on page 324, just over halfway down, there's a question. How is God's will done? Okay, if you would, please read that together with me. How is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die, this is his good and gracious will. Okay, you can put those back away now. How is God's will, is, how is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name, that is to keep it holy, or to let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith until we die. This is his good and gracious will. And that's what this is about today. At the risk of offending you, to help you get over yourself and to trust in Christ for your salvation and for your life. For to live a godly life truly is to live by faith in Christ alone and not by the works of the law. That is, not to trust in what we do in any way, shape, or form that could contribute to our salvation. To that end, let's look again at the parable of the laborers in the vineyard in Matthew 20, our gospel reading today. And so either flip to the back of your bulletin, or if you have a pew Bible, pull that out to page 1048, or if you have your own Bible, find Matthew chapter 20. The parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Jesus says, for the kingdom of heaven is like, and when you hear that language from Jesus, what he's, he's, he's saying, God works in this way, right? It's not the only way, but one of the, one of the ways in which God works the way God arranges things is this way. The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. That would be in the neighborhood of 6 a.m., okay? The workday would begin about then. So he would go out, so a master goes out to hire laborers. And now verse 2, after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. A denarius was the standard wage for a day's work. So what we would consider whatever the median income is and break that down into a day, that's what a denarius would be. So we met these workers at 6 a.m. They all huddled in an area where they men willing to be hired. And he hired, they said, you'll go work in my vineyard for the day and I will pay you the standard day's wage. Now vineyard work, by the way, as we'll discover by some of the language later, this is not easy stuff. To, to grow a grape crop that does well, it requires constant, persistent pruning and watering and so forth. This was not easy, okay? Then he continues. So the master then, now verse three, goes out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Now kids, that's I-D-L-E. Idol, not I D O L, idol, which means false worship. Idol, in this case, I D L E, means you're standing there, you're not really doing anything. So he saw, so the master went out at the third hour, so this is about 9 a.m., and he saw others standing idle 
in the marketplace, and he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give to you. And so they went. So he says to guys who hadn't been hired at the beginning of the day, you go out, work in my vineyard, we'll settle up at the end of the day. So going out then, the master did, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. So he goes back into the, where the, all the workers are hired. He goes back, so he goes out at 6 a.m., he goes out at 9 a.m., he goes back out at noon, he goes back out at 3 p.m. and hires more laborers to work in his vineyard. And now in verse 6 he says, about the 11th hour, this would be about 5 p.m., near the end of the day, about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing idle. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Now let's stop there a minute. Because this tells us something about the master of the vineyard. He is hiring men up to the end of the day. Does this mean he has work? Yes, but it also means, it also implies by the context here, that he is generous. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Verse 8, evening came. The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay their wages, beginning with the last, those hired at 5 p.m., and up to the first, those hired at 6 a.m. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. So the guys hired at five got a denarius. Now when those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius, again the standard day's wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, friend, I have done you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? And so then take what belongs to you. I choose to give to this last one as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? And that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is the point of the whole thing. Or do you begrudge my generosity? And so then Jesus says, as he had said at the, beginning of the, la at the end of the last chapter, so the last will be first, and the first last. Things are not as they seem in the kingdom of God. Consider this for a second to reflect on the parable. And I'm not, not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you have ever been without work? How many of you have ever been fired or unemployed or under or underemployed? Right? You want to work and yet there's not work there, right? You can, get, you can get pretty down on yourself in those situations, can't you? You can sink into bad habits. You can become lazy, despondent, even despairing. Because, right, there is, there is a dignity in work, isn't there? It is, work is, as we know from the creation account, work is given by God a way by which he upholds the creation, right? And you know what it's like if you who have been without work, especially those of you who are with family, who have families and are un unemployed or underemployed. You know what it's, you know, it's like to be able to wonder if you're gonna be able to put food on the table or you're gonna be able to take that little trip to go see your relatives or whatever it might be. And so this, in this parable, the master, the landowner, I mean, he knows this. These guys are working from day to day. And in his generosity, these, are, these aren't guys who are lazy. And th these are guys who showed up and wanted to go to work and they didn't have an opportunity. And he went back and again and again and he said, you go. And you know what this master did by doing that? By enabling these men to go home and provide for their families, he gave them dignity. 
in the first workers rather than be thankful, and this is part of our point today, rather than be thankful for the opportunity to know from the beginning of the day that I have work as a man and I'm going to go home and provide for my family at the end of the day, rather than be thankful for receiving that which they promised, they complained and grumbled. We could probably go on for a long time about this. But at the end of the day, friends, it's not that complicated. Those of you who are in Christ and have make this a regular part of who you are and re have received the Lord's teaching, you, you know the truth. You know that when Jesus calls you to faith, that when you are baptized into his death and resurrection, he calls you into a life of service and sacrifice and sometimes, yes, suffering. We know this. We know that Jesus teaches this. We know how, for example, Paul in the establishment of the first churches in Asia, how he returned to them after they appointed pastors and he said to them very clearly, it is through tribulation, through trouble and trial that we enter the kingdom of God. This is not a secret. It is not a hidden teaching. And yet we love to grumble. Children, you love to grumble about your teachers. Right? Maybe not today. But you do. Teacher didn't do things the way I wanted. Da 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 da. You gossip to your friends. You gossip to your family, right? And you forget the fact that these folks worked all day for you, and then you, and then, as you may not know, that they end up going grading papers. That this is not an eight-hour job. This is a twelve, a fourteen-hour job. And oh, we love to grumble. Our teacher did this. Teacher did that. We love to grumble against our spouses. Oh, he looked at me the wrong way. And we spend our whole day stewing about something we assume. Or she did this, he did that. We grumble against our employers. We grumble against our employees. Grumble against our church. We grumble against God. Again, we, we, can, make this, we can make this very complicated. Um, but I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. My call, our call, is to tell the truth. For crying out loud, we grumble. You, likely, do a little more grumbling than you should. And so let's return to first things. Isaiah 53, speaking of the Christ. Isaiah prophesied that he was oppressed he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. The message, friends, simply is this, to get over yourself and to remember the one who didn't grumble, who rather said, Thy will be done. And children, that's pictured right in that window right there. Jesus, who had done no wrong in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he is preparing to suffer, be beaten, spit on, mocked, and die for you and me in our grumbling. And in the process of that, knowing God's will, that he had been placed in this position, he opened not his mouth. He didn't grumble. He said, thy will be done. And for you, for me, for our ungrumbling, for our ungratefulness, for our bickering unnecessary with our spouse, for our chomping at our teachers, and all that other stuff that we talked about. Jesus said, I'll pay the price for that indignity that they have done. And as we know then, on the third day, he rose from the dead victorious over sin and death and the devil. He is God. And he forgives you. He forgives you. And today sets you free and calls you to remember 
that to live a truly godly life is to live by faith in him who rose from the dead, who alone could work salvation for us. The Christian life is a life lived by faith in Christ who is righteous for us, not by faith in how well we do it in any way, shape, or form. It's not complicated. And that, friends, is the truth. May then the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed.